Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. All right, well, good morning. Welcome. Glad that you are here. If you are in Center Court East, glad you're here. If you're in Center Court West, glad you're here. If you're at the Woodlands campus, really glad that you're here today. And if you're watching online, glad that you're coming to us that way as well. Take your Bible, and we're going to go to Luke chapter 19. That's right in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in the New Testament. If you need a Bible, flag down one of the ushers. They'll have them uh, for you. Just sort of wave your hand. They'll be glad to let you have one and uh, you can borrow it or you can keep it if, if you need one. It's our gift to you. So we'll go to Luke chapter 19 in just a few minutes. So the Astrodome was in the news this week. Did you notice? My, uh, my son, my older son, takes kind of an interest in, in following sports and sports arenas. And we were talking about the Astrodome. He said, Dad, Dad that's, the, uh, that's the round one, right, next to the NRG Stadium. Yeah, that's right. And uh, he, he said, so, so, like, what sort of things went on there? I said, oh, son, <laughs> there were so many things. That's, when I was your age, I said, you know, that's, that's, that's where you'd go to the, uh, the Astros games. That's where you'd, get to, you'd go to the rodeo. And, uh, and the Texans? No, actually, see, because we didn't have the Texans back then. Back then, Houston had the Oilers, the greatest football team. They took the ball from goal to goal like no one ever seen. And he said, so did they ever go to the Super Bowl? No, they didn't ever go to the Super Bowl because the Pittsburgh Steelers always got in the way of us going to the Super Bowl. So anyhow, as we were talking, I, I just was intrigued by the fact that, that he, he, had no, he has no memories from that era, because he just wasn't here yet. The reason I share that with you is, is because I want to talk about another structure today that probably none of us have any memories, collectively speaking, uh, with which to work when we come to talk about this structure. What I'm talking about is the temple, the Jewish temple that used to stand uh, as the epicenter of Judaism in the heart of Jerusalem. That's what I want to talk about as we round out this series that we've been uh, doing here the past several weeks. You remember two weeks ago we talked about how uh, Jewish people wanted a king, and then last week Pastor Dan talked about the law, and then today I'm going to talk about the temple, and we've been talking about how all three converge and pointed clearly to Jesus and to his arrival and uh, from there onto us a, a, as his followers. So I want to continue, uh, and, and, and let me just give you a little background, so because none of us really have any way to, so like what went on there? Let me give you a little background. It's kind of interesting. So the Jewish temple was a place that the Jewish people understood uh, really had two benefits. There was two things you did at the temple. The first thing was that if you wanted to meet with God, that's where he was. And so that's why Jewish people were always making their pilgrimages back to, to Jerusalem, because they, they, if you want to meet with God, that's, that's where he is. And specifically, not just like anywhere around there, but specifically in this certain place in the temple that was called the Holy of Holies, that had this big curtain that separated everybody else from the, the God's all-encompassing presence called the Shekinah glory that was behind that curtain. So anyhow, everybody wanted to go back to Jerusalem because that's where you could actually feel close to God. Now, a second thing you have to understand about that, they, they understood that this is also the place that you would go to make your sacrifices. You say, well, why would they make sacrifices? The reason they would make sacrifices is because everybody had this, this awareness of the fact that they were sinful and that they had fallen short of God's glory and that you just can't just amble on into God's presence any old way and just say, well, hey, God, how you doing? No, no, no. You, you were infected with sin, and here he is holy and perfect. And, and so something had to, to, to cover your sins. Something had to take the hit for your sins. 
if you wanted to approach God. And that's why they would have these animal sacrifices and the, the blood of the animal would, would, would be your uh, symbolic covering so that you could go forgiven into the presence of God. That's why, incidentally, they would buy and sell the animals right there in the temple courts because a lot of people were coming a long ways, and it's kind of hard to bring your animal along that you're going to have to sacrifice all those miles. And so they just make it easy and say, well, you can just buy your animal here uh, when, you, when you arrive. Now, we hear about these animal sacrifice th- th- thing, and, and people today think, yeah, is that kind of an archaic system? Doesn't that seem a little backwards? Doesn't that seem a little, that's a, sort of a crotchety old God that required you to have a sacrifice for your sins so that you could come into his presence? People say, yeah, I believe in a God of love. That you could just, I just, I, I just, who'd want to have a grouchy, crotchety old God? Well, Let me see if I can give you an illustration that can help us to understand it a little bit more clearly. Borrowing from Tim Keller, whose uh, many thoughts I'm borrowing from uh, today. I think this illustration is particularly helpful, though, when it comes to understanding what we're talking about here. Suppose you had a child. Many of you do have children. But let's just suppose for the sake of illustration, you had had a little daughter. and And she's your only child. And um, you and your spouse have just doted on her uh, as she's growing up. She's just the apple of your eye. And you never miss a concert. You never miss a recital. You, you never miss a sports game. You're, you're just, your world revolves around her. And you just love her, and she loves you. And it's just this wonderful blessing. And she's growing up, and all the while, you, you're, you're wanting a better future for her and a better life for her, and so you're always saving. Every month you have your money, and you're saving, uh, and you're saving, and you're saving. Why? Because you want to be able to, for her to go to a college. And <clears throat> so you're setting that all aside uh, for that day, and she's growing up, and you're so proud, and, and, and things are just turning out. The story's just turning out the way it should turn out. And then one day she graduates from high school, and, and you have a celebration, and it's a big deal, and, and now she's going to go off to college. And she heads off for college, but she doesn't get to college. And at first you're worried, but then you find out from a trusted source, oh, no, no, she's fine. Uh, I mean, she's alive, but she didn't go to college. She went off to a different place. You're like, what? Yeah. And I don't think you'd like to hear how she's living. How's she living? Well, she's living this wild life, crazy life. She's just basically just undoing everything that you tried to do for her. All of those years that you had her in the home, 18 years. And, and she's, doing, she's just frivolously living, carelessly, wild, crazy. And, and then you go to your, uh, you know, to your bank or you go online and, you, and all of a sudden your bank account has been drawn out and she's taken hundreds of thousands of dollars that you had saved for, for her to have the college education and she's just burning through it and you can't have access to her because you can't exactly find out exactly where she is because she always kind of stays on the move and, and you and your spouse are just broken hearted and, 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 and despairing. You say, oh my gosh, everything that, and it's just down the tubes and and now suppose this goes on and it's just crushing your spirit and then two years later she just shows up back at home and just walks right through the back door now suppose she just walked in and said hey mom and dad how you doing just casually cavalierly no big deal as if nothing's been going on these two years now what would you do in that instance well i mean initially you'd be like oh my thank god you're alive and, but once you got past that, you'd be like, uh, no, wait a second. <laughs> uh, you can't just come strolling in the back door like nothing's happened here since we last saw you two years ago. You, you've broken our hearts. You, you, you've, just, you've crushed us. You've betrayed us. You've stolen from us. You, you, you can't just amble in here like no no big deal. Now suppose she heard you and she's like, gosh, mom and dad, you're being so grouchy. Did somebody get up on the wrong side of the bed? I mean, you should be happy that I'm home. You'll be like, well, yes, we, of course, we're, we're happy that you're home. And, and it, But no, we're not being crotchety. I, I love you and, and I have loved you and I always will love you. But but there's a bit of an elephant in the room right now. And we've got to talk about this. I mean, you've driven this wedge in between our relationship. There's this breach of trust, and, and you're going to have to take some responsibility for it. 
You, you can't just come in like just nothing ever happened. Now, that's a very good picture of our situation before God. The Bible says very clearly that all of us, like the little girl, we were all created by him. And he has always loved us, and we've always been the apple of his eye. And he had great plans for all of us and to, to prosper us and to bless us. But every single one of us, the Bible says, like sheep have gone astray. And we've all gone off and said, essentially, no, I think I'll just live my life the, the way I want to live. Nothing against you, God, but I got this. You know, I'm, I'm clever enough, I'm smart enough, I'm rich enough, or I'll be rich enough, and, and I can do this. I can do this on my own. And we have all, like sheep, gone astray and essentially just wadded up everything that he had in store for us, everything he had in mind for us, everything he carried in his heart for us, and just thrown it down. And so that's why, you see, the, the people understood, you can't just go just... just ambling right on into the temple. No, 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 no. There's, there is a breach that, that we have caused. And there is going to have to be some, some payment, some restitution, some ownership for that. Some sacrifice is going to have to be made if, if we're going to be right with God again. That's why they would have these animal sacrifices. Now, the book of Hebrews tells us that it was a system that on the one hand was good, on the one hand it was not so good. On the one hand it was good because it was a system that enabled people to actually figure out, okay, there is a way that I can, can, can come back into God's presence. And deep down, all of us want to, to be in God's presence and know that we're loved by him and forgiven by him. And, and so this was a system that created a, a means by which that could happen and the sacrifices could be made. And, and so it was good in that regard, but it wasn't good. In another regard, it was incomplete. There was always a sense of incompletion to it. Namely, you, you'd finish doing the deal and the sacrifice, and, and then you'd leave Jerusalem, and, and you might feel good about it for a day or two or three or four, or maybe a week or two and, or a month or two, but, but then finally, you know, you, you have this sense of, yeah, I'm sinning, I'm guilty. I'm not right with God again, and I need to go back. And so the, the, the sense of incompleteness or incompletion to it was that it had to be, it, you had to just keep doing, doing the same thing over and over and over, showing back up, doing an animal, and, and, and coming back into God's presence, being forgiven, and then going out, and i got to come back, got to come back. And come. So it was always incomplete. And it was also incomplete in this regard as well. When I said that you could meet with God there in the temple, that's where people went to meet with God, that's right, sort of, but technically not entirely because really you didn't go back in the Holy of Holies, not the common man, not the common person. Only one person went behind that curtain to the Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest, and he only did it once a year because the, the Shekinah glory might just be so much that he might even just fall over and drop dead. And so they'd tie a rope around his leg when he went in, just in case that happened, and they could just pull him on out. And, and so in that regard, the system was kind of incomplete, that, that you're not really coming to the presence of God. You're getting very close, and you're making a restitution, and your sacrifice for your, uh, for your sins. And, uh, but there was also this sense of incompletion uh, to it. Now, all of this background in mind. Let's move forward to Palm Sunday. That's the day that Jesus comes riding in on a colt into Jerusalem, and his kingship is declared finally. And it's a big day, and he is getting ready to shake up everything about the system that I was just telling you. Let's read it. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. 
When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive those out who were selling. It is written, he says to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the teachers among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they couldn't find a way to kill him because all the people hung on his words. Luke 20, verse 1. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us, by what authority you are doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Now, why were they upset? Well, he was marching in to the temple courts and acting like he owned the place. He was just turning the, everything upside down. And, and he forms this whip. It says in another account, he gets this whip, and he starts cracking the whip and turning over the tables of the money exchangers and throwing the money exchangers out. I mean, this is not gentle G G G Jesus, gentle, meek, and mild. This is a different Jesus than we've seen, right? And he's, he's acting like he owns the place. That's why they're saying, by what authority are you doing this? Then he says, my house shall be a house of, of prayer. And yes, you did hear me right. Did he just say my house? He, yes, this is my house. This temple, <laughs> it's my house. What he was saying, don't you realize, is that the temple's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a provisional thing. But I've come now to replace it. He says, recorded in Matthew 12, 6, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. You're looking at him. So you see what he was, what he was doing this. Uh, well, let's back up. It's, so, so again, they're perplexed, and they're asking Jesus, wait, by what authority are you doing this? Perhaps the best answer to that question is recorded by John in chapter 2, where he, 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 he says, well, you want to know what authority I have to do this? Here you go. Tear down this temple, and in three days I'll build it back up. Now, they didn't understand what he was talking about, but let's us not miss what he was talking about. See, what he was doing is he was saying, he was talking about the, the temple building. He was building a bridge from that to him. He was saying, your, your eyes and your focus have, have all been on the temple. Not anymore. Now, all eyes on me. I'm the king that you've been waiting for. I'm the ultimate temple, the final temple. And, and so this is, this is why this was such a huge thing that he was doing. He was saying, now I am the real temple of which that was just a foreshadowing for all these hundreds of years until I got here. He said, what two things always happen in the temple? That's how you met with God and that's how your sacrifices were paid for your sins. Well, guess what? Those two things will happen through me. The way that you'll meet with God is through me. Why? Because I and the Father are one. He goes to the Father, comes by me. And there's one God and one mediator, and I am that final sacrifice. So this is why they're going, wow. So, so it's not about a building anymore. Or it's, no, it's not about a building anymore. It's about me. And he sets out proving it by tipping over the tables and moving the furniture around. Now, if you know anything about furniture in houses, you know there's only one person who's qualified to move the furniture in a house, and that's the person who owns the house, right? And so I couldn't just go over to your house today and just say, well, you know what? I, I think let's move this sofa over here and that chair, ugh, let's get rid of that. And then this artwork, I think we'll get rid of it. I couldn't do that. Why? Because it's not my house. It's your house. And neither could you come into my house and start moving our furniture around and changing things out because why? It's not your house. And in our house, only one person decides who gets to move the furniture. That's Suzanne. 
And I remember learning that uh, in a memorable way soon after we got married. See, I moved into the house a few months before we got married. And until that point, I fancied myself to be a decent decorator. I mean, I would have hung my shingle up and said I was a decorator, but I thought, I'm not so bad at choosing these sorts of things. But I would find out soon, after we got married, she came in and she began to sort of move things around a little bit. And I remember one day I came home and this was over here. And another day I came home and that was over there. And there was always new little changes happening here and there. And I should tell you, I'm a little bit OCD. And so change is kind of hard for me and, and surprises. I don't, sometimes I don't do particularly well with them. And, and, and I remember finally one day saying, baby, <laughs> How long is this going to go on? You, I mean, you're, you're really kind of messing up my house. And I remember her saying, uh, no, wait, 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 wait. Uh, when we got married, your house became our house, which really means her house when it comes to, to decorating. And that's the way it should be. Single guys, you tend to, we tend to think we're really good at things that we're not so good at until you get married, then you find out. She really will be a lot better at that than I will ever be. So it's the way that it should be. The point being, the only person who gets to move the stuff around is the person who is in charge of the house, who owns the house. And this is exactly what Jesus was doing in the temple that day. He was establishing, it's all about me. I'm in charge here. No more beating around the bush This place is mine. I am the final temple. You say, wow, that is kind of interesting. But so what? I mean, what's that have to do with us today? Two things. First thing it means for us is that we get to have direct access to God. We, we have direct access to God. How? Through Jesus. The, let me illustrate what this means. I'm thinking of a guy who uh, several years ago we were talking, and we talk off and on, we're friends, and, and he's never quite come to a point of trusting his life to Christ. We talk about the gospel and, and about how Jesus came to live the life of perfection that we couldn't live, and he died the death of suffering that we all deserve to die, and he went to hell in our place as our sacrifice, and he rose. And we, oh, we've talked about that uh, any number of times. He never quite wraps his mind around this, and so we were talking one day. And he said, uh, he mentioned, well, you know, the other day I, I, I did something. I, I tried to do something nice for some people who needed something. He said, well, that's good. What would you do? Well, you know, I gave him five bucks or ten bucks to, to this person or whatever. I was like, oh, that's good. And then he said, well, because, you know, I, you want to stay in good terms with the, with the big man above. And, and someday I want to think he's going to let me in. I said, no, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't use these words because I hadn't preached to him this sermon, but I could have said, now that you understand, I could have said, wait a second, you're, you're going back to an old system and, and sort of acting like you have to provide your own sacrifice, your own atonement, your own covering to sort of rebalance the scales. And so you go out and you give some money to some homeless people, and that makes you feel good. And in your mind, you say, there, that probably gets me back in God's good stead. And, and that, that's not the way it works. We go straight to God through one thing. That's Jesus. He's the only medi- mediator. He's the only go-betweener. We trust him and what he did on the cross. He was the final sacrifice. So you go and help poor people. You should do that. And you be generous and you be kind. Yes, do all of that, but you're not doing that so that that can work you back into God's good favor. That's not, no, no, no. You do that in response to the fact that he sent Jesus for you and you've trusted in him with your life for your salvation and he's come into you and now you feel freed up to do things for other people that you might not have done otherwise. I think of another uh, person called on the phone just the other day. And she called because she had a relative who was nearing death. 
And we talked about that for a little while. And, and at the end, I said, well, let me say a prayer f- for you. And, and so we prayed over the phone. And then I said, amen. And I was thinking we'd get ready to hang up. But she blurted out, Pastor Ken, yes. She said, one more thing. Oh, okay. She said, well, we'd really like it if you would come over to the house and um, sort of do that last stuff with him before he dies. And would you do that? I said, wait, 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 wait. wait. Now, <laughs> what is it? You want me to come over and do the last stuff? What, what is the last stuff? She said, well, like, isn't there like a preacher supposed to come over before he dies and like you're supposed to like pr- pray for him and that everything will work out right and everything when he died? Ah, oh, no, 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 no. I said, you're, you're going back to, you're going back to an old system. You, you, <laughs> you're treating me like uh, I need to be the priest who will come in between him and God, and I'll sort of do his bidding for God and secure his salvation. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, isn't that kind of, no, that's not the way it works. Why is that? No, no, because after Jesus, he's the final priest. He's the final sacrifice. He's the final temple. He's our all in all. He is the go-betweener. You, you, so I can come over and say a prayer with you, sure. But you can go and say a prayer. You don't need me to come and do that to, because I, I don't have any special powers. Only Jesus has the power to forgive. And that's why we celebrate as Christians through Christ. We have direct access to God. That's the first thing it means. Second thing it means He gets direct access to us. He gets direct access to you and you and me. And what this means is God doesn't do consulting. He's like, what? Well, have you ever had a consultant maybe come into your your business place? Consultants are great if you get a good one because consultants come in and uh, they survey everything that's going on and and then they give you this big report and, and they say, hey, we've been observing and here's what we, you seem to be doing this very well and this very well and this very well and maybe you could stand some improvement here and you know, industry standards or you might want to catch up a little bit here and, and then they give you the whole deal and you pay them however much you agreed on in the contract and then they get on an airplane and they fly away. And the great thing about consultants is you can take it or leave it with their consultation. If you feel like they gave you good counsel, you can enact everything that they suggest. But on the other hand, you're like, well, I think we'll do this. Not, I don't think we're going to do that. I'll throw that part away. God doesn't do consulting with us. God does God. So that means we get access to him through Christ, but he gets access to us as well. That means our lives belong to him. When we surrender our life and we say, I, I want Jesus, I want all that you've done on the cross to count for me, and I'm trusting in you and you alone for my salvation. I'm giving my heart and my life and my all over to you. Then he says, great, you've got a deal. Now in return, I want all of you. That means you're going to follow my nudgings. You're going to heed my promptings. When I say go here, you're going to go there. When I say do this, you'll do it. When I say, why don't you be generous to that person, you'll do that. Why? Because you belong to me. You're my child. So God doesn't do consulting. He does God. Now, this is the part of the sermon that gets a little challenging for us. Because I've just noticed over the years, there's any number of people who say, well, you know, I like the thought of being able to have access to God through Jesus, and I, I like the thought of living with him, having abundant life in this life and eternal life in heaven. I like all of that. It's this part about sort of handing over the keys. To, I, I don't know if I really want to do that. I mean, you know, a little religion here every Sunday or two, that's, that's okay. But, I mean, you're talking about, like, really, like, 
hand in your life. Oh, yeah, that's the deal he offers. That's the only deal he offers. He says, everything that I have done for everything that you are. Here's the craziness of it, though. Any number of us, we still try to convince ourselves, I don't know if that's a trade-up. I think maybe I would know better how to lead my life than he would know how to guide me. I mean, I know he created me and everything, but I, I think really probably I, I am. A, I mean, what if he came into my life and really kind of messed it up and turned over some tables and moved some furniture? And, oh, I don't know. I think I kind of want to stay in here. That's not the deal he offers. But trust me, it's a trade up. He says, everything that I have done and all that I am goes to you. But in return, you hand over your life to me. You surrender your life to me. <clears throat> it's a trade up. It'd be like this. Suppose somebody walked up to you and said, I got a deal for you. You're like, okay, what's the deal? Suppose they walked up and said, well, uh, I'm going to give you everything that I have. Really? How much do you have? Suppose they said 100 million. Really? Yeah. And I just, I'm going to give that to you. Okay, what's the catch? Well, the catch is you're going to give me everything that you have. You're thinking to yourself, well, I got a couple hundred dollar bills in my pocket and a few thousand in the bank. And now, what are you going to say in that moment? Let me think about this. No. You take the deal, right? Because it's a trade up. This is what Christ does. Now, some of you have plenty of money. You say, I don't know if that analogy really works for me because I, I got enough money. It makes me think of my friend. I'll call him Don. Met him several years ago when he and his family came to church here. We ended up becoming friends and had coffee and had a very interesting story. And <clears throat> turns out he'd been one of the vice presidents of Hal Burton for years. I said, if I'm adding the years up right, that was like right about when Dick Cheney was there. He said, oh, yeah, I know Dick. Know him well. I said, really? Yeah. And uh, he kind of told me about his career. And he, he said, you know, my wife and I, we've had a very blessed life. God's really, we, we've had all sorts of blessings. We've gone anywhere we wanted and had most anything we wanted and met all sorts of people, presidents, White House, Saddam Hussein. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah, we met all sorts of people. I said, well, then, but why, why are we sitting here having coffee? He said, well, because now I'm in my mid-70s. He said, and uh, I've been listening to you a few Sundays, and I've got thinking, uh, you know, we've had a great life, but it ain't going to go on forever. You start thinking that when you get to be my age, he said. He said, you, you begin to realize, that, okay, now there's something beyond this, but like what is that and how does that work? And he said, I think I've come to the realization that we've tended to all aspects of our life very well, except the spiritual aspect. We haven't done much with the spiritual aspect. I said, oh. He said, that's why I wanted to meet with you. I said, well, that's fantastic because that's actually one thing I know something about. And, and from there, we began to talk. And we began to meet on a weekly basis, and I explained to him the gospel. And, and for weeks and weeks, I, I, he, he would do this certain thing where he, he, would, he would sort of talk about this person that he knew or that place that he had gone or those things that he had done or those accomplishments that he'd earned. And, and, and I'd keep going back to the gospel and say, yeah, but remember, remember, Don. The gospel's not about what you do. You can't work your way into God's favor. None of us can. That's the reason that God sent Jesus. Either you'll die in your own sins or you'll have to have a sacrifice. And there's only one fitting sacrifice, and that's Jesus and what he did on the cross. And you've got to trust in that, and that alone. 
And over the months as we met, I've got to watch him come into a realization. Not even very long ago, he said, yeah, I remember a couple of years ago when we started talking and I used to think, I'm a pretty good guy. I mean, I've, I've done this and that. I've never done anything too bad, I don't think. And that's how I used to think. He says, but the more that we've talked and the more we've done Bible study together, the more I've realized I'm just a sinner like anybody else. And I need God's grace just like everybody else. And he said, now you've got it done. Now you've got it. That's the gospel. And what a joy it's been to watch him and his wife to step into faith and entrusting Jesus and then to watch how that's affected their lives and their priorities, their use of time, their use of finances. And now their eyes have actually been opened to things that they had never noticed before and people that they had never seen before. And, and, and actually watching that discipleship happen in their life and watching the glow grow on their faces as they've moved into the center of the gospel. Today's Palm Sunday. It's the day that Jesus went riding into the center of Jerusalem. And he said, now I'm in charge. I'm the real temple. I'm the final temple. All eyes on me. My question is, Will you let him ride now into the center of your life and open up your heart and open up your mind to him? With all the passion I can muster, I hope so. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the way that you did come into Jerusalem. And boy, did you ever take over. And... Within several days, it found you on the cross, which in the great plan that you always had was exactly where you were supposed to be so that you could die for our sins as that final sacrifice so we don't have to have the animals anymore so that we could be forgiven. Thank you, God, for then offering that life to us the same life that brought you back on Easter, which we get to celebrate next weekend, is available to us. That's a marvelous thought. My prayer, Lord, is that every single person hearing my voice today would say yes, would say yes to you, would realize Jesus is better. Jesus is better than this. Jesus is better than, Jesus is better than anything that I could ever have. And that we would make that great exchange all that you have to give us for all that we are. Lord, I pray for those who are here who, even as they've heard today, they think, well, I don't know that I ever really did trust in Christ. I think I've kind of sort of trusted my own goodness or my own merits or sort of my own ability to sort of balance the scales out and and all. This frames it up totally different. Helps me to realize I, I too, need a Savior. My prayer, Lord, is that any person in that uh, mindset today would say in the quietness of this moment, yes, Jesus, I want you. I'm taking you. You be my Savior. And I'm surrendering my life over to you. I pray, God, for those of us who've journeyed years with you because it's tempting for any of us, all of us, to sort of try to put our hands back on the steering wheel, to sort of put our hands back on the keychain and say, well, yeah, I'll just go ahead and sort of take back over here. You say, no, 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 that's not the deal we made. You belong to me. And I have secured your eternity. But in return, I'm asking you to surrender to me. I want you to give us grace to re-surrender and to trust you knowing that you, Jesus, are better. You're better, better, better than anything we could ever come up with. And we're grateful. And we pray it all in your strong name. Amen.
Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, I'm Marianne Reed, and welcome to Postscript. I'm sitting here talking to Pastor Ken Warlein, who just finished the third sermon in the series, Jesus, the Prequel. And I have three questions for you, so thanks for being here. Sure. The first question is, in the sermon, you said that Jesus is the new temple. She writes, I had always heard that we, as Christians, were a temple. What does that mean? Yeah, right. And so what the questioner is asking about are those verses uh, like in Corinthians that say, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, collectively and individually, we now, our bodies, are the temple of the Holy Spirit that he's living in and working through, which is absolutely correct. And I actually thought about working that into the message, but a message can only have so many symbols before it just gets muddy and confusing. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about the temple and how the, 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 Jesus is saying, uh, you're looking for something that's better than the temple, here I am. Um, we also talked about how he's the, the final high priest, he's the final sacrifice. And after all of these th things converged in Jesus, I started thinking, you know what, this is just going to get too confusing if, if, if then I go on and say, and now you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and, and, and all. So that would just have to be in the sequel if we had a sequel to the, to the prequel yeah. <laughs> series. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the second question, next question, if Jewish people do not believe Jesus was our last sacrifice, why do they today still not put forth sacrifices to approach God? Sure. And, and that's a good question. Um, th I think it, it really all comes down to the, the fact that after 70 AD, uh, you have, they, they don't have a temple anymore. And it was at that point that the traditions of Judaism became more important and they started putting all of their energy into the Mish Mishnah, Mishnah um, and these traditions that they were passing uh, down uh, sort of telling uh, the stories and, th but the sacrificial system, uh, the sacrificing of the animals and all kind of fell out when there was no temple anymore to do it in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the last question in Hebrews, it talks about those before Jesus being saved by faith. What does that mean given that they lived before Jesus came on our behalf? Sure. Right. And you got the great hall of fame uh, there chapter in, in Hebrews that talks about all these great Old Testament characters. And that's a great question. So they didn't have Jesus to trust in for their salvation. So did they go to hell? Well, no, clearly not. Hebrews tells us uh, quite clearly to the contrary. So what was it that they were trusting in? Well, they were trusting in as much of God as he had revealed himself uh, to them. They didn't have the fullest and the final revelation of God, which would come through Jesus. But they were trusting in him as much as he'd revealed himself. And so it, it began with Abraham. You go back to Genesis 15, and God says to then Abram, that was his name first, says, now I want you to get him, you're going to move. And he says, so where am I going to move? Well, I'll just tell you. Just get on the road. Here we go. And he began uh, to move and, of course, would actually move over to the, the land that now is referred to as the Holy Land. And that's where the Jewish people would begin to uh, multiply. And then they'd go to Egypt for a few hundred years and that whole story. And then they'd come back through Moses and everything. But what did they say, what does it say in Genesis 15 that was uh, the redeeming quality in Abraham's life, his faith? It was credited to him as righteousness. What was his faith? He followed as much of God as God had revealed himself uh, to man at that point, as did all of these other 
Old Testament characters. Then we move into the New Testament and we have even a fuller final uh, revelation. Oh, and Jesus says, now you've been wondering, what does he look like? I and the Father are one. Mm -hmm. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So it makes it easier. So we who, who come after Jesus uh, uh, really have an easier time of it than perhaps the people in the Old Testament times did. Well, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pastor.